Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat, everybody. Welcome. How's 9 o'clock doing today? Awesome. It's great to see you. My name is Greg Hintz, lead pastor here at The Place Church. Thank you for being here today. You picked an interesting Sunday. In fact, you picked an interesting month to be here uh, because this month I'm sharing a series simply entitled Shipwrecked, Navigating the Storms of Life. And uh, for me, I've had, I've had four main traumas uh, that have affected me in my life, of which you get four weeks, you get one a week. <laughs> Lucky you. Wait till next week. All right, so uh, been unpacking that, but really why we're here is this word right here. So let's open up God's word together to the book of Psalms, Psalm 34. Psalm 34. And in Psalm 34, I want to look at two verses, but before we get to that, can we pray? Bow your heads with me. Father, I pray for the word that's going to come forth. I pray that our hearts are open, our minds are open, ready to receive your word that is alive, living, and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, divided between soul and spirit. Father, that you have a plan and a purpose for each and every single person here. And I pray that today can just be another step on that journey. I pray that in Jesus' name. Everybody says? Amen. Amen. So starting in verse 18 in Luke chapter, uh, or Psalm chapter 34, it says that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. I still remember the first time that I read that verse, how upset I was at two words that I see right there, the words brokenhearted and crushed. <laughs> Because I thought when I became a Christian, everything would be perfect. Is there anyone else out there? Gave my life to Jesus, everything is going to be fine. But this verse tells me that if the Lord is close to the broken hearted, if the Lord is close to those that are crushed in spirit, that even though I'm a believer and a follower of God, that there's a good chance in my life that I'm going to experience broken heartedness or that I may be crushed in spirit. And, and when I think about that, I realize that probably that's the one common denominator between us all. That if you looked back at your life, that there were seasons, there were times, there were moments, there were experiences that you've had on that journey that you've been on to experience that crushedness, to experience that brokenness in spirit. And, and when I think about that in my life, really, it reflects all the way back to this guy right here, my dad. And my dad is holding me after my first haircut. Yes, yes. I think I was bald for like the first three years or 20 years. I don't know. But uh, it was a long time. But, my, you know, my dad, some of you actually knew my dad because my dad was an active part of this faith community right here. Uh, he has an interesting story. If you traced it all the way back, he had a mom and dad, Maynard and Eleanor. Are there any Maynards in the house? Maynards. That's quite the name, right? And, and, and my dad, his childhood was like you would figure for, for most, except my dad had an experience that happened when he was a child that really changed the entirety of his life, and it had to do with his dad. Because, see, his dad was a firefighter, and his dad was a paramedic, and his dad was a first responder, in his city, so he would normally be the first person if something were to happen. Well, there was uh, one day when there was an, an accident. The accident was a, in the afternoon, it was a drunk driver had hit a electrical line, and the electrical line had fallen, and my grandfather was the first responder there that day, and he went there, and he was rushing to the car to rescue the person in the car, and tripped and fell on a live wire, and that electrocuted my grandpa. What you have to know in the backside of this story is my grandpa left this earth, but my dad was left. My dad was 15 years old at the time, and the message to him was simple. You now are the man of the house. You have two younger brothers that now you're going to have to care for. His mom was sickly. She had polio when she was young, and she also uh, later in life was diagnosed with MS. She was always sickly, and he was now at the age of 15 expected to become the man 
of the house. So what he did with the grief of losing his father at the age of 15 was simply stuff it down. Which at the time, that was normal. That's how you dealt with things. For example, some of you guys may have heard the statement, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Just get back out there. Put a smile on your face. Suck it up, buttercup. All right, maybe not that one. That's a little extreme, right? But that message of you just keep going. And and so my dad really believed he was doing the right thing by continuing to march and continuing to live and not ever dealing with the loss of his father at the age of 15. Oh, it gets better for my dad, though, because he graduates high school and then he's drafted into Vietnam. Then he goes in to Vietnam to, to fight this war. Now, my dad was in artillery, which meant that he was shooting these missiles or bombs into the enemy territory. But this was the first time my dad ever killed anyone. You see, when you shoot a bomb into a body of people, normally some of those people die. And so my dad now, he has this thing that he's dealing with. Now he's, he's in this war. He does have a bright moment, and I shared it with you last week, because as my dad was in Vietnam, he gets this great idea that he's going to marry his 17-year-old girlfriend. The problem, she was in Ohio and he was in Vietnam, but that's okay. And my dad, you know, worked it out. She ran away from Ohio, got on a plane, went to Hawaii. Yeah. And uh, three days after her birthday, they got married. This is their marriage photo. This is that actual day that they got married. My mom's 18 years old and three days in that picture. Yeah, her mom wasn't happy. In fact, it's interesting because last week I was going through my dad's belongings and I found a letter that my dad had kept since this moment here. See, before this, word had gotten out that they were planning on getting married. So a priest wrote my dad a specific message and the specific message to my dad was, don't you dare marry this girl. So my dad, who had a good faith, he was very Catholic, very committed to the church, but now was being told by the priest, don't do this. And what did my dad do it? My dad did it. Another thing pushed down. And see, this, this was my dad's life because after Vietnam, he came back to the house, but he's trying to live with all of this grief that he's never, ever dealt with. It was all sitting like right below the surface. And you know, back in the day, they didn't even know what this thing was, PTSD or anything like this, but my dad was suffering from that. And I believe not only from the war, but I believe from what he experienced when he was 15 years old too. And so he has all this stuff going on. He had no idea how to deal with it. How do we deal with that? I mean, we don't even know. And so my dad's way of dealing with it was just to separate himself emotionally. Sometimes I would see my dad kind of just staring off into nothing. He would begin to numb it, and the way that my dad would numb it, he would have a few beers at night. He'd sit in front of the TV, have a few beers, fall asleep, wake up, go to bed, and the next day do the same thing. He wasn't, he wasn't beating me, he showed up to work every day, he was a faithful provider. What he was doing, he was just trying to survive. See, sometimes we do that. We're just trying to survive. It it changed my life when I believed that maybe people are just doing the best that they know how to do. And if they knew better, they would do better, right? If I could just help them see that. But my dad never had that, and there was nobody that was helping him. But he still tried. I mean, I look back at memories with my dad. I mean, they were good memories. My, My dad really really tried to to hold it all together, to be the dad that he was supposed to be, the husband that he was supposed to be. He was really, really working at it. And we lost my mom, and then my dad was left in Ohio. They had built their, their, their dream retirement home in Ohio on 10 acres of land. Oh, they loved it. But now, once my mom died, he was there all by himself. And his only son, me... Moved to Arizona. (laughs) Sorry, Dad. 
Um, I remember we were on, it was around Christmas time or it was coming up on the holidays, maybe about this time that it is right now. And we were on a phone call with my dad. He was in Ohio and we were here. It, it had just about two feet of snow had just fallen in Ohio. It was dark, cold, and miserable. And I could see my dad was depressed. I could see that via Skype. I say to my dad, dad, you, you got to get out of there. You can't stay in that thing all winter all by yourself. It's not good. He's like, all right, I'll come visit you. He comes out here to visit me. That brother never left. I had to change houses just to get rid of him. <laughs> but, you know, he, he, he came here. And I believe that his time in Arizona was really, really good for him. It was very therapeutic for him. He began to make friends. In fact, many of you knew my dad uh, and had a relationship with him. I mean, he was just a wonderful, wonderful guy, especially when he got here and started to heal, started Jesus, started moving in his life. And one thing that he loved when he came out to Arizona was his motorcycle. That's a picture of his mo. He loved riding motor. For some reason, he didn't like it in Ohio. It's probably because there's only three days you can ride in Ohio, right? It's raining or snowing every other day. But he loved riding his bike, man. He was so excited. And the other thing that you have to know about my dad is that I think because of all of these issues that he had, he was extremely anxious. He, he was an anxious person. I think now I realize that. I didn't realize it at the time, but it affected him. So he never did things that were dangerous or he never did things that were uh, he thought through everything and had a plan for everything he said one day he tells me that he has this incredible idea that he wants to go on this motorcycle trip and, and I said where do you want to go dad that's awesome and he tells me about this place where the railroad tracks meet in Utah or somewhere and there's a golden spike that goes into that he tells me the story and I'm like that sounds lame, lame-o, right? But my dad loved history, and he loved trains. And so for him, it was the perfect fit. And I remember just getting so excited for him and be like, yes, dad, this is what I'm talking about. This is getting, going out there, go and do something. So he went with, with another person, and they, they traveled out. And I'll, I'll never forget them taking off. And I was just so proud of him for actually trying something different for for just getting out of his comfort zone well i actually um it's probably better for me just to read you what i had wrote shortly after the day that he he left because the story it really wasn't a good one so here, here's what i wrote so my dad died yesterday I guess that's how you do it, right? Like a Band-Aid that has been left too long and sealed itself to your skin. You pull it off and you endure the pain that you know is bringing healing. But, but the statement isn't really true. My dad actually died two days ago, but they didn't tell me until yesterday. A ball dropped by a phone call to a police officer to a memo that sat on someone's desk was the news that the one who grasped my hand as I took my first steps, hugged me tight when I graduated high school, and sat each week to hear me speak in a church that he had been part of since the very beginning. That memo, that memo sat from night till morning and never made it to my ears until a medical examiner called me to question me about the death of my dad. He said, is this Greg Hintz? Uh, yeah. By now, you are aware of the passing of your father. Uh, what? Oh, well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it tells me here that you were notified about, about what? A heat starts to move up from my chest. Sir, 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 I am so sorry to be the one to tell you this. This is not our normal protocol. We, we want family members to be informed in person, and it tells me that you were notified. Again, again, sir, this is not the way. Well, just hurry up and tell me. I don't care about your protocol or your mistakes or your stupid memos. Just tell me what I already know because of your broken protocol. Around 9.30 p.m. last night, your father passed away. His words continued, but I was disconnected from them. The heat transformed into a lump in my throat as I tried to swallow the flame. I was driving. I pulled over. You know, that was the day that I um, found out about my dad. And 
I wrote that day uh, this thing called Sitting Shiva. My dad died yesterday. And starting on what you just read, I, I began to write every single day. What you have to know about my relationship with my parents is I was my parents' only kid. And so for me, my mom had already passed. And once my dad passed, it was different. Once my dad passed, it, it was like this, this dark loneliness came over my life because now my mom was dead, my dad was dead, I had no brothers or sisters, and I was left all by myself. Now, what you have to know is in this season, I love God. In this season, I'm a pastor at this incredible church called The Place. And I was hurting so bad. I was tempted just to keep going. I was tempted just to push it down like my dad had done. That's an easy temptation to do, but something came over me, and I said, I can't do that. I can't continue this. So I just shut up myself in my house for the next seven days. I cried. I thought. I wrote. I drew close to my family. I did things that I'd never done before. You know, I'd done both of my mom's funerals. Yes, I had to do two funerals for my mom. I did it without crying a tear. Tears had not entered into my eyes, but now I was allowing tears to wash my soul. It was changing everything. In fact, I, I wrote about that, and I didn't tell first service about this, but in this same, in this same thing, I want you to hear what, what I ended up saying because this is uh, an important part of this grief process. I said, I have heard it said that tears are words that the heart can never express. I believe that. I also believe that tears are healing to my soul. As a family, we choose to speak unexpressionable words and heal together. With wet eyes and a hurting heart, we throw our arms around each other and strengthen each other in this hard time. You see, that was what I was learning in that moment is that I don't have to go through this grief alone. I don't have to go through this grief by myself. That there were people inside of my, and I didn't have to pretend like it didn't exist. It did exist. It was real in my world. And I love the words of C.S. Lewis who said this, no one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. And if you've ever experienced grief, you know what I'm talking about, that darkness, that heaviness. But then the question comes, okay, what are we going to do with this grief that we have? And I, I want to tell you, uh, honestly, this is from my life, from my heart, from what I've experienced. I've learned three things about grief. The first one is this. It's part of life. I wish it wasn't. I wish it was gumdrops and lollipops the whole way. Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? But it's not. And, and you know what? Jesus told us that. In fact, if we look at John 16, here's what it says. It says, this is the words of Jesus. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Man, wouldn't it be better if Jesus was like, no worries, guys, no more troubles. You're on the Jesus train. Woohoo! That's not the truth, though. Grief is a part of life. We're all going to face it. And when we face it, what you have to know is that you choose the reaction that you're going to have towards that grief. That's right. We all make that choice. We could choose to bury it. We could choose just to keep going, to put the painted smile on, to pretend like everything's perfect. We could choose that. That is a choice. In fact, maybe even up to this point, when you look at your life and the grief that you've experienced, that has been your choice. I talk to people all the time. I talk to people that have everything that they could possibly want, have a house and a family and money, retirement account, everything that they need. And they look at me and say, I'm miserable. We get to the bottom. We start talking about grief. They start talking about this thing that's buried in their soul. See, what we don't realize is when we don't deal with grief, it affects us in a negative way. 
Listen, if you're in a place where you feel miserable all the time, but there's no reason for you to feel miserable, I'm going to ask you, it's time to search our hearts. It's time to search those things that we've just been pushing down because there's another way for us to react. Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And watch what he says. He says, and I will give you rest. You know, I talk to people all the time and they're like, I want the rest. I want the peace. And Jesus said, all right, if you want it, come to me. And they're like, ah, no, I don't want to come to you, Jesus. I don't want to revisit that wound. I don't want to revisit that pain. I don't want to look at that thing again. I just want your peace, love, and joy. I just want all that stuff in my life. But then we begin to realize is that Jesus said you can have it, but you have to do the beginning at the end. See, we want the blessing, but blessing always follows obedience. And so the blessing is that he will give us rest, but the obedient part is come to me. And so we have to ask ourselves, have we brought that grief to Jesus? Have we set that before him? And sometimes we're like, no, because I don't know what he's going to do with it. Well, if you do that, if you go to him, God will show you compassion in your grief. We see this even in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 31 through 33. It says, for no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. And so we don't have to fear going to God with grief. I don't have to fear that because he will show us compassion in our grief. You know, one of the, it's the shortest verse in the Bible, and a lot of people talk about it because of that. But in John chapter 11, verse 35, is these words, Jesus wept. But what you have to know about this story is that Jesus shows up at a funeral or at a burial site. He shows up at a graveyard. The person's already dead. Jesus knows he's about to bring the dead person back to life. He knows he's going to be able to sit with that dead person again. That Lazarus is going to rise and be alive. He knows that in his head. But watch this. As he sees the grief of those that he loves, he weeps. Why? Because he feels that pain that we experience. He understands that pain that we go through. We don't have to go through it. And it's not like, well, you've never uh, felt this, God. No, he has. He felt it and he wept. So he understands and has compassion for our grief. You know, grief is not a disorder or disease or a sign of weakness. Grief is not a sign of weakness. You know what it is? It's an emotional, physical, and spiritual necessity. This is my favorite. It's the price you pay for love. Think about that. It's the price you pay for love. I mean, we grieve much. We're in pain much. Why? Because we loved much. You know, part of me was looking back and saying, oh, I wish I, wish I would have done this, or I wish I would have done that, or I wish I would have said this, or I wish I would have said that. But then I have to come to the place where I realize that I, I can't. And I don't believe that my dad would ever want me living in regret. I don't think he would ever want me living in sadness. Because my dad, too, had faith. And in fact, I didn't read this at first service, but I just want you to read this letter that he wrote right before he died to his friends who had moved to Texas. I'm not going to read you the whole letter, just one paragraph. And I want you to hear these words. He said this. He said, um, he said, so even in some sorrow at your leaving, because they had moved to Texas, there can be great, great joy that only we, his people, can bring to our fellow human beings that are so desperate for his love. Listen to what he said. I believe that you too are being given an absolute great chance to live out that which we declare at the place church each Sunday. Taking the word of Jesus to those in our neighborhood, country, and world. 
And then he said, and we are, underline all caps and bold, making a difference. You know, when, when that was shared with me, that was something that had already happened. It had already come to pass. This was a response to one of the things that I wrote that he shared back with me about my dad. And that's the interesting thing about when you allow yourself to go through grief, you heal. It hurts, but it healed. And here's what it healed in my heart. There were wounds and pains with my dad being lost and being dead, not being alive anymore. There were wounds there, but guess what? There were a lot of wounds that entire childhood that I had. If you ever had a parent that was emotionally separated from you, it's hard. It's a hard pill to swallow. But when I allowed myself to grieve the loss of my dad, God not only healed that hurt, but he began to heal all the hurts from my past. In your life, I just want to ask you this question. Are you grieving? Have you experienced grief? Has grief gotten stuck on the inside of you? Because if it has, the only cure for grief is to grieve. That's the only cure. And I would say for us as followers of Jesus, that begins when we open our hearts, we open our lives, and we invite Jesus into our mess. When we invite Jesus into our grief, See, because that's the choice we have. That's what we can do. You're going to come to that crossroads one day if you're not there today. You're going to come to the crossroads of grief, and you're going to be tempted. I promise you you're going to be tempted. I was tempted just to put on the mask, put on the fake smile, and just keep going. It's going to be okay. i got to be strong for my family. That was the mantra in my head. i got to be strong for my church. But Jesus says no. You don't have to be strong for anyone. See, Jesus in the midst of your ultimate weakness is your strength. You don't have to be strong in your grief, but you do have to give it to him. Listen, if you've had grief sticking in, sticking in you for a long time, I want you this week, maybe open up to Jesus a little bit and say, Jesus, I, want, I don't want this anymore. Will you help me let go? Will you help me move on? Will you help my life change? Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Will you bow your heads with me? God, I thank you so much for your loving arms always around us. And I thank you, Father, how we don't have to just come to you with good stuff. That you want us to come to you with everything. With grief and sadness. With anger. With frustration. And God, I just pray for our community, our faith community, right here at the Place Church. I pray that we can always be a people that live in authenticity, that live in honesty and live in truth. I pray that we never feel like we have to pretend like we're not hurting or pretend like grief isn't there or pretend like we're not frustrated. I pray that we can be open and honest with each other. And God, I pray that we can be open and honest with you. And Father, in that openness, in that honesty, in that authenticity, God, I pray that you heal our hearts and as you heal us, Father, I just pray that you draw us closer to you. I know your word says that you came to give us life and life in abundance. And Father, I believe that as you heal our grief, the abundant life can begin. I pray that everyone here, Lord, will live and walk in abundance each and every day. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.